Dear friends in Christ, our risen Savior, may the love of Christ Jesus fill your hearts. May the joy of Easter continue to resound with you each and every day. Amen. One of my favorite stories that my brother-in-law likes to tell just about every time we get together is the story of when Carla was a little girl, and he figures about four years old. As a little girl, she wanted to follow her big brother's lead. And so whenever Derek had something, she had to have some of it too. If Derek had ice cream, she had to have ice cream. If Derek had cookies, he, she had to have cookies. If Derek had yogurt, she had to have yogurt, even when she didn't like it. And so Derek learned as an older brother pretty quickly that when he had something, Carla would want it as well. But he also learned, as a good older brother would, that it didn't matter how much he gave her. But as long as he gave her the last scoop, she would say she got all of it. So, he, for example, let's say he had some ice cream. He could take four large scoops of ice cream and give her one small, tiny scoop. And as long as it was the last scoop, she would have all of it. Perception, huh? It's interesting when we look at perception, I mean, even as a four-year-old or an eight-year-old or as an adult. We have certain perceptions of the world, certain perceptions of the way people live and the way people act. And so whether or not you've looked at life as Carla did when she said she had all of it, sometimes we do look at the world, though, and we have a certain perception. We look around us and we see that some people seem to be doing better than others. We look at some people and we see that they seem to be more blessed than others. They seem to have more than others. Maybe at times we may not have said it ever, but in our heart of hearts we might have wondered if they are more loved by God than others. There are those who have steady income, a good job, or at least a solid retirement. And we look at them and they have a comfortable home, a place to live, and we wonder, well, are they doing something different, something better than another person who is struggling, who doesn't ha maybe have a home or an income, or someone who is more beautiful than, or handsome than someone else? What did they do to become more attractive? What about those people who have better health? The people who seem to never have to go to the doctor. Stress in their life seems to just roll right off their back. Have you ever been envious of those people? It seems like no matter what comes their way, they can take it and they are as smooth as water. Where some of us, though, we struggle with that stress and it seems like sometimes it becomes catastrophes. There are even those who seem to have their scripture down. Never struggle with their relationship where there are others who constantly seem to wrestle with that relationship with God. And we look at them and we may be led to ask from our perspective, are they more blessed? Are they more loved than someone else, than those who are wanting? It'd be easy to ask that question in our world today, wouldn't it? Because even if you've never asked that question, you know that you've heard people ask that question. You've looked at other people and they've asked that and wondered out loud even, are some other people more blessed? In our world today, that'd be easy because we've had a change in our value system, haven't we? In our world today, our value system is not based on someone's merit. It's not based on someone's word as, and their, or their integrity. But it's based on how many toys they have, right? How rich they are. What they can do. Don't we even say, keeping up with the Jones. No, we, uh, we've, we've really changed our value system and we've moved away from Christian values. Instead of valuing people as God values people, as, instead of valuing our lives, our relationships, as God values relationships, our world has moved us in a direction where we value things by how much they're worth, by how much we can get for them, by what benefit they are to me. Our world, our value system, is much more based on selfishness than sacrifice. When we look at our epistle lesson for today, though, we see a reality that is quite different. We see a reality that Christ, an example that he has set, that is far from what our world has set. When we look at the words of John in 1 John chapter 4, we hear these words. This is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Notice who it's about. Notice who the subject is. It's not us, is it? The subject of the sentence is God. 
God has loved us. He has shown His love for us. That while we were yet sinners, He gave His life for us. And we hear Jesus' own words in John chapter 15. Greater love has no one than this, that He lay down His life for His friends. You are my friends. We see that love involves sacrifice. Love is not simply about something about what we give or take or what we can expect from someone else. Love is not about what we deserve, what we have earned. Love is not about the way we've lived. But notice for God, love is about showing us true love in the in this sacrifice of His Son, in the precious death and resurrection of Jesus. He showed us true love. And notice it wasn't about Him. It was never about Him, but it was about what He had to do for us. It was about giving His life, sacrificing His life for you and for me. That was the ultimate act of love. That is what true love is. It is sacrifice. Now this kind of flies in the face of the world as well, doesn't it? Because in our world today, love even seems to point towards what can I get from it? It's contrary to the scriptural definition of love. Because in Scripture, love is about sacrifice for another person. But in Hollywood, in the fairy tales, love is about the fluttering of the heart, the stomach with the butterflies, the goo-goo eyes of star-crossed lovers staring at one another. Love has become more about a feeling than about sacrifice, hasn't it? Because when we talk about love today, a feeling seems to be more what we want. We want feelings because it seems to have this explosion inside of us that sacrifice doesn't seem to. And our world today talks about that Hollywood love, that fairy tale love, and oh, we see where that leads. No, true love is not about that, ki- that first kiss, or true love is not about those feelings in the first six months. True love is about the long haul. It's about the long-term relationship that you have. Husbands and wives know this. True love is not about every day being a happy day, if only, right? True love isn't about trust. It isn't about facing the challenges by yourself and the trials by yourself, but it is trusting one another. And true love is founded on the love of Christ. But we know that love is not only in a relationship between a husband and a wife, is it? True love extends into our relationship with our family members, our brothers and our sisters, our relationship with, from parents to their children and grandparents to their grandchildren. We know that that love, that love also needs to be founded in Christ. Because if it is not, the sacrifices we make for others, they become sacrifices of resentment. The sacrifices we make for those we care about become p- poisonous and overwhelming. When our love for one another is not based on God's love, it's hard to trust one another. And we know that this even extends outside of family, doesn't it? Because true love extends even to friends as well. How many of you have a friend that you can rely on and tell them anything? A friend that when you're in trouble or when you're struggling with something, you can bounce ideas off them and they will be honest with you. They won't just tell you what you want to hear, but they will be honest with you. Those are the kind of friends, those are the kind of friends that are born through time and born from a relationship first with God. Because those kind of friends will call a sin a sin. Those kind of friends will encourage you when you need encouragement. Those kind of friends will will point you to Scripture and point you to your prayer life point you to your relationship with God when you feel like you're slipping, when you're sliding away. But it's hard, isn't it? It's hard in the world that we live in today because even though we know what is the the design for love and the design for relationships, it's easier to focus on what we want, what we need, what we believe we deserve. It's easy to get into that selfish behavior, that focus on, well, this is what is owed to me. For that is what the world says. But this again contradicts the very words of Scripture. John again in verse 12 of our epistle for today. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. 
His love is made complete in us when we share His love with others. When we share His love with a spouse. When we share His love with a, a, a son or a daughter. When we share His love even with an enemy. His love is made complete in us. But it is hard to see that love come to completion, isn't it? It's hard because people do things that offend us. People do things that hurt us. People do things that push us the wrong way and rub us the wrong way. People do things unintentionally. People do things intentionally. People betray us. People hurt us. People make it hard for us to love one another, don't they? How many of us in our own lives, in our own relationships, find it hard to love one person or another? How many husbands and wives struggle because they don't have enough time together? Or even when they balance their budget, they, it seems like the numbers don't line up or, or they're just, they, 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 there's certain things that set one another off. How many parents and children argue with one another because they can't come to a common consensus on what is best for, for them? How many friends sometimes grow discouraged because they feel like the other friend has not given as much as they've taken? You know, this world today that we live in, we see all the time where love seems to get abused. Where love seems to get left and stomped out and left in the trash. We live in a world today where love has become a simple, I love you, sweetie, but become empty. Because love, as strictly words, is only words. Love is more than words, so it is actions as well. When we look at Scripture, when we go to 1 John 4, 1 through 12. Notice how many times, first of all, he says that word love. And I think in the whole entirety of chapter 4, he says it, a love 27 times. But as we look at that word love, we see one word. But for the Greeks, they had four different words for love. One that were, it was talking about friendship. One that was talking about passion. One that was talking about the relationship a brother and sister have. But one that was talking about self-sacrifice. John here uses the word talking about self-sacrifice. The word agapao, or as a noun, agape. You've heard this word before, I'm sure. Because this word is one that is commonly used in the church because it draws us back to God. That word agape draws us back to His great love for us because it was His true sacrifice that showed us true love. And that is the word that John is encouraging us to show to one another that John is encouraging us to show to those people who sometimes cause us offense and sometimes cause us harm. That word love, that agapao, means sometimes it will be difficult. Sometimes it will hurt. Sometimes our love is going to be tattered and torn and it is going to go through the washer and it's going to get wrung out and it is going to be left hanging. But that is why it is not our love alone but the love of the Holy Spirit living in us. As the Holy Spirit lives in us, as the love of God lives in each one of us, a natural extension then is that His love flows to others. When we share our love, it is not our love alone, but it is the love of the Spirit living in us. When we share God's love, it is the Word of the Holy Spirit working through us, strengthening us and supporting us, carrying us through those difficulties, sharing love with even the most unlovable, you know, there's a saying that's out there that I detest. I might even go so far as to say I hate. You may have heard it before. I don't know if you've used it or not, but some people will use this saying, and that is, friends are God's apology for family. Has anybody heard that saying before? Followed quickly by the idea of that I don't have to like them. I just have to love them. Well, like I said, I detest both, the, both of those sayings, in fact, because... Friends and family, God has given in our lives to strengthen and to support, to love, to care about. And there will be those times where it is downright hard, where our family members annoy us, where our friends disappoint us. But there is never a time where we should not show that true love, that love that God has first shown us, that undeserved love. Because God's love is everlasting. God's love is eternal. It is a love that does not fail even, even when our love fail, fails towards others. When we grow selfish, when we grow self-indulgent, 
God's love never fails. Because in the center of true love is, of course, forgiveness. In the center of true love is forgiveness. Because true love came with the forgiveness of our sins. Those sins we've committed in the past, those sins that we continue to commit each and every day, those sins that we will commit in the future. When Christ went to the cross, when Christ paid the price, He did not simply do it for those sins that have long passed, but He conti- but that was a, a down payment for all of us. That payment on the cross was for now and forever. That payment on the cross could not be fully realized, though, until He rose. Because that is when He showed us that true love in His forgiveness comes with an empty tomb. It comes with a defeat of death. It comes with victory for each one of us. Notice his death was not alone a resurrect his death and resurrection was not alone a guarantee for him, but it is a guarantee for each one of us. It is a guarantee for sinners in a sinful world. It is a guarantee for the broken in a broken and broken relationship. It is a guarantee for the destitute of heart and the destitute in life. It is a guarantee that our love that God's love for us will never fail. It is not some empty love. It is not some superficial love. It is a, when we receive the love of God, we receive all of it. True, truly all of it. Every last bit of it. Because when God poured out His love for us on the cross, He gave everything He had. He shed His blood. He shed His tears. He felt the abandonment and the, and the rejection. But He also knew it was necessary. He knew it was necessary, and so he, d- he experienced the pain and torture, and then he defeated death. He defeated death, and he gave us the promise of everlasting life, the promise that one day we will spend eternity with him, the promise that no matter how our life goes in this day, in this age, that there is a promise yet to come, that we will be with him forever, and that we will know the fullness of his love and the completeness of His sacrifice. And so as we continue in this Easter season, may the love of Christ fill your hearts. May His joy ever abound in you. And may you know with full full certainty that because Christ has risen, you will rise as well. Alleluia, Christ has risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Let us pray. Holy Father, everlasting Lord, We give thanks to you that your love is eternal for us, that as you have loved us, that we may love one another. Lord, forgive us for those times when our love is empty, when it is heartless, when it is self-centered. Forgive us for those times when our love does not reflect your love. But give us the full assurance that because you have shown us the true act of love on the cross, because you have shown us your forgiveness on the cross, that we need in fear, that we may know with full assurance that one day, We will be with you forever in heaven. May this be the hope. May this be the comfort. And may this be the joy that leads us now and always. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen.